Roaring Trumpet, Episode 5. To recap what happened in Episode 4, we found our heroes inside an unusual cave where they had spent the night, but which turned out to be a giant glove. The glove's owner, Screamier, quite genial for a giant, was on his way to a giant gathering, and Loki convinced him to invite them along. They arrived at the giant's hall, where Thor, in his bold, forthright manner, announced to their host, the head giant Utgarda Loki, that he had come for his hammer, Mjolnir. At first, Utgarda Loki denied knowledge of its presence and refused Loki's proposal that they search for it. But then he proposed a series of contests to decide whether or not the search would be allowed. The games began. Although trickery was suspected, they were not able to confirm this, and first Thor, then Loki, and finally Thialfi all lost to their giant opponents. Meanwhile, Harold Shea had been trying unsuccessfully to use the magic spell Loki had given to him. A blow to the head caused his eyes to tear, and suddenly it was revealed to him that the giants were indeed using trickery and magic, and that their giant opponents were not giants at all, but were unstoppable magical beings. Tonight we learn the fate of our adventurers who are in the heart of the enemy's lair. Will Harold Shea at last prove his worth? Will Thor recapture his imprisoned magical hammer? In episode five, find out what comes next for our Nordic friends. A chorus of yells announced that Utgard Loki's cat had arrived. It was a huge beast, gray in the size of a puma but it did not look too big for the burly Thor to lift. It glared suspiciously at Thor and spat a little. Ugar Loki rumbled. Quiet, you. Ain't you got no manners? The cat subsided and allowed Thor to scratch it behind the ears, though with no appearance of pleasure. How had I seen through the illusion of the eating contest? A teardrop in the eye. Would I have to bang my head again to get another one? I close my eyes and then open them again, looking at Thor as he put an arm around the big cat's belly and heaved. No teardrop. The cat's belly came up, but its four big paws remained firmly planted. How to induce a teardrop? A mug of mead stood on the table. I dipped a finger into the liquid and shook a drop into my eye. The alcohol burned and stung, and I could hear Thor's grunt and the whooping of the giants. I shook my head and opened the eye again through a film of tears as I repeated, Sudri, Nordri, Nidi, Nai. It was not a cat Thor was lifting but the middle part of a snake as big around as a barrel. There was no sign of head or tail. The visible section was of uniform thickness, going in one door of the hall and out the other. Loki, that's not a cat. It's a giant snake that Thor's trying to lift. With a strange shimmering blackish cast over its scales? Yes, and no head or tail in sight. Now, right good are your eyes, eater of turnips. That will be nothing less than the Midgard serpent that curls round the earth. Surely we are surrounded by evil things. Hurry with the finding of the hammer, for this is now our only hope. Shea turned from the contest, making a desperate effort to concentrate. I looked at the nearest object, an auric skull on a pillar, tried another drop of mead in my eye, and repeated the spell, forward, backward, and forward. No result. The skull was a skull. Thor was still grunting and heaving. I tried once more on a knife hanging at the giant's belt. No result. I looked at a quiver of arrows on the opposite wall and tried again. The sweet mead was sticking my eyelashes together, and I felt sure 
I would have a headache after this. The quiver blurred as I pronounced the words. I found myself looking at a short-handled sledgehammer hanging by a rawhide loop. Thor had given up the effort to lift the cat and came over to them panting. Utgard Loki grinned down at him with the indulgence one might show a child. All around, the giants were breaking up into little groups and calling for more drink. Want any more, sonny boy? Guess you ain't so damn good as you thought you was, huh? Shay plucked at Thor's sleeve as the latter flushed and started to retort. Can you call your hammer to you? The giant's ears caught the words. Beat it, thrall. We got business to settle, and I won't have no snotty little mortals butting in. Now, Asa Thor, do you want any more contests? I... She clung to his arm. Can you? I, if it be in view. I said get out of here, punk. Utgard Loki bellowed, the rough good nature vanishing from his face. He raised an arm like a tree trunk. Point at that quiver of arrows and call. Shay dodged behind Thor as the giant's arm descended. The blow missed. He scuttled among the crowding monsters, hitting his head against the pommel of a giant sword. Utgard Loki was roaring behind him. He ducked under a table and passed some foul-smelling fire giants. He heard a clang of metal as Thor pulled on the iron gloves he carried at his belt. Then, over all the other sounds, rose the voice of the red-bearded god, making even Utgard Loki's voice sound like a whisper. Mjolnir the Mighty, Slayer of Miscreants, come to your master, Thor Odinson. For a few breathless seconds, the hall hung in suspended animation. Shea could see a giant just in front of him with a mouth wide open, Adam's apple rising and falling. Then there was a rending snap. With a deep humming, the hammer that had seemed a quiver of arrows flew straight through the air into Thor's hands. There was a deafening yell from the swarms of giants. They swayed back, then forward, squeezing Shea so tightly he could hardly breathe. High over the tumult rose the voice of Thor. I am Thor, I am the Thunderer. Ho, 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 yo, yo, ho. The hammer was whirling around his head in a blur, sparks dancing around it. Level flashes of lightning cracked across the hall, followed by deafening peals of thunder. There was a shriek from the giants and a rush toward the doors. Shay shot one glance as the hammer flew at Utgard Loki and spattered his brains into pink oatmeal, rebounding back into Thor's gloves. Then he was caught completely in the panic rush and almost squeezed to death. Fortunately for him, the giants on either side wedged him so tightly he couldn't fall to be trampled. The pressure suddenly gave way in front. Shea caught the giant ahead of him around the waist and hung on. Behind came Thor's battle howl, mingled with constant thunder and the sound of the hammer shattering giant skulls. A noise that in a calmer moment, Shea might have compared to that made by dropping a watermelon ten stories. The wielder of Mjolnir was thoroughly enjoying himself. His shouts were like the noise of a happy express train. Shea found himself outside and running across damp moss in the middle of hundreds of galloping giants and thralls. He dared not stop lest he be stepped on. An outcrop of rock made him swerve. As he did so, he caught sight of Utgard. There was already a yawning gap at one end of the roof. The central beam split. A spear of blue-green lightning shot skyward, and the place began to burn brightly around the edges of the rent. A clump of trees cut off the view. Shea ran down here with giants still all around him. One of the group, just ahead, missed his footing and went rolling. Before Shea could stop, he had tripped across the fellow's legs. His face plowed up cold dirt and pine needles. A giant's voice shouted. Hey, gang. Look at this. 
now they've got me. I rolled over, my head swimming from the jar, but it was not me they were interested in. The giant over whose legs I had fallen was Heimdall. His wig knocked askew to reveal a patch of golden hair. The straw with which he had stuffed his jacket was dribbling out. He was struggling to get up. Around him, a group of fire giants were gripping his arms and legs, kicking and cuffing at him. There was a babble of rough voices. He's one of the Aesir, all right. Sock him. Let's get out of here. Which one is he? Get the horses. If I could get away, I thought, I could at least take news of Heimdall's plight to Thor. I started to crawl behind the projecting root of a tree, but the movement was fatal. One of the fire giants hallooed. There's another one. Shea was caught, jerked upright, and inspected by a half a dozen of the filthy, gorilla-like beings. He took particular delight in pulling his hair and ears. Ah, oh, he's no Oz. Bump him off and let's get the hell out of here. One of them loosened a knife at his belt. Shea felt a deadly constriction of fear around the heart. But the largest of the lot, leadership seemed to go with size in giant land, roared. Lay off. He was with that yellow-headed stumper. Maybe he's one of the veins, and we can get something for him. Anyway, it's up to Lord Surt. Where the hell are those horses? At that moment, more fire giants appeared, leading a group of horses. They were glossy black and bigger than the largest percherons Shea had ever seen. Three hoofs were on each foot, as with the ancestral Miocene horse. Their eyes glowed red like live coals, and their breath made Shea cough. He remembered the phrase he had heard Heimdall whispering to Odin in Sphere's house, fire horses. One of the giants produced leather cords from a pouch. Shea and Heimdall were bound with brutal efficiency and tossed on the back of one of the horses, one hanging down on either side. The giants clucked to their mouths, which started off at a trot through the gathering dusk among the trees. Far behind them, the thunders of Thor still rolled. From time to time, his distant lightnings cast sudden shadows along their path. The Redbeard was certainly having fun. The agonizing hours that followed left little detailed impression on Harold Shea's mind. They would not, he told himself, even while experiencing them. The impression was certainly painful while being undergone. There was nothing to see but misty darkness, nothing to feel but breakneck speed and the torment of my bonds. I could twist my head a little, but of their path could obtain no impression, but now and then the ghost of a boulder or a clump of trees momentarily lit by the fiery eyes of the horses. Every time I thought of the speed they were making along the rough and windy route, my stomach crawled and the muscles of my right leg tensed as I tried to apply an imaginary automobile brake. When the sky finally turned to its wearisome blotting paper gray, the air was a little warmer, though still raw. A light drizzle was sifting down. They were in a countryside of a type totally unfamiliar to Shea. A boundless plain of tumbled black rocks rose here and there to cones of varying sizes. Some of the cones smoked and little pennons of steam wafted from cracks in the basalt. The vegetation consisted mostly of clumps of small palm-like fern trees in the depressions. They had slowed down to a fast trot the horses picking their way over the ropey bands of old lava flows. Now and again, one or more of the fire giants would detach themselves from the party and set off on a tangent to the main course. Finally, a score of the giants clustered around the horse that bore the prisoners, 
making toward a particularly large cone from whose flanks a number of smoke plumes rose through the drizzle. To Shay, the fire giants still looked pretty much alike, but he had no difficulty in picking out the big authoritative one who had directed his capture. They halted in front of a gash in the rocks. The giants dismounted and one by one led their steeds through the opening. The animals' hooves echoing on the rock floor of the passage, which sprang above their heads in a lofty vault till it suddenly ended with a right angled turn. The cavalry halted. Shea heard a banging of metal on metal, the creak of a rusty hinge, and a giant voice that cried, What you want? It's the gang back from Jotunheim. We've got one of the Aesir and a vein. Tell Lord Sirt. How'd you make out in Utgard? Lousy. Thor showed up. He spotted the hammer somehow, the scum, and called it to him and busted things wide open. It was that smart Alec Loki, I think. What was the matter with the sons of the wolf? They know what to do about old red whiskers. Didn't show. I suppose we gotta wait for the time for them to come around. The horses tramped on. As they passed the gatekeeper, Shay noticed that he held a sword along which flickered a yellow flame with thick curling smoke rising from it, as though burning oil were running down the blade. Ahead and slanting downward, the place they had entered seemed an underground hall of vaguely huge proportions, full of great pillars. Flares of yellow light threw changing shadows as they moved. There was a stench of sulfur and a dull machine-like banging. As the horses halted behind some pillars that grew together to make another passage, a thin shriek ululated in the distance. Bring the prisoners along. Lord Sirt wants to judge them. Shay felt himself removed and tucked under a giant's arm like a bundle. It was a method of progress that woke all the agonies in his body. The giant was carrying him face down so that he could see nothing but the stone floor with its flickering shadows. The place stank. A door opened and there was a babble of giant voices. Shay was flung upright. He would have fallen if the giant who had been carrying him had not propped him up. He was in a torch-lit hall, very hot, with fire giants standing all around, grinning, pointing, and talking, some of them drinking. But he had no more than a glance for him, for them, right in front, facing him, flanked by two guards who carried the curious burning swords, sat the biggest giant of all, a giant dwarf. That is, he was a full giant in size, at least 11 feet tall, but with the squat bandy legs, the short arms, and the huge necklace head of a dwarf. His hair hung lank around the nastiest grin she had ever seen. When he spoke, the voice had not the rumble of the other giants, but a reedy, mocking falsetto. Welcome, Lord Heimdall, to Muspelheim. We are delighted to have you here. <laughs> I fear gods and men will be somewhat late in assembling for the battle without their hornblower. <laughs> but at least we can give you the comforts of one of our best dungeons. If you must have music, we will provide a willow whistle. <laughs> Surely so skilled a musician as yourself could make it heard throughout the nine worlds. <laughs> Heimdall kept his air of dignity. Bold are your words, sir, but it is yet to be seen whether your deeds match them when you stand on Vigrid Plain. It may be that I have small power against you of the Muspelheim blood, yet I have a brother named Frey, and it is said that if you two come face to face, he will be your master. Sirt sucked two fingers to indicate his contempt. <laughs> it is also said, most stupid of godlings, that Frey is powerless without his sword. 
Would you like to know where the enchanted blade, Hunting's banner, is? Look behind you, Lord Heimdall. Shay followed the direction of Heimdall's eyes. Sure enough, on the wall there hung a great two-handed sword, its blade gleaming brightly in that place of glooms, its hilt all worked with gold up to the jeweled pommel. While it hangs there, most stupid of a seer, I am safe. <laughs> Have you been wondering why that famous eyesight of yours did not light on it before? Now you know, most easily deceived. In Muspelheim, we have found the spells that make Heimdall powerless. Heimdall was unimpressed. Thor has his hammer back. Not a few of your fire giants will bear witness if you can find them. Sert scowled and thrust his jaw forward. But his piping voice was as serene and mocking as before. Now that really gives me an idea. I thank you, Lord Heimdall. Who would have thought it possible to learn anything from one of the Aesir? <laughs> Skoa? A lop-eared fire giant shuffled forward. What you want, boss? Ride to the gates of Asgard. Tell them I have their horn tutor here. I will gladly send the nuisance back to his relatives. But in exchange, I want that sword of his, the one they call Head. <laughs> I am collecting God's swords, and we shall see, Lord Heimdall, how you fare against the frost giants without yours. He grinned all around his face and the fire giants in the background slapped their knees and whooped. Pretty hot stuff, boss. Ain't he smart? Two of four great weapons. Boy, will we show them. Sert gazed at Shay and Heimdall for a moment, enjoying to the utmost the roar of appreciation and Heimdall's sudden pallor. Then he made a gesture of dismissal. Take the animals away and put them in a dungeon before I die laughing. Shay felt himself seized once more and carried off, face downward, in the same ignominious position as before. Down, down, down they went, stumbling through the lurid semi-dark. At last, they came to a passage lined with cells, between whose bars the hollow eyes of previous arrivals stared at them. The stench had become overpowering. The commanding giant thundered. Stag! There was a stir in an alcove at the far end of the passage, and out came a scaly being about five feet tall, with an oversized head decorated by a snub nose and a pair of long pointed ears. Instead of hair and beard, it had worm-like excrescences on its head. They moved. The being squeaked. Yes, Lord. Got a couple more prisoners for you. Say, what stinks? Please, Lord, mortal, him die. Five days gone. You lug? And you left him in there? No, Lord, here. Snog say, no, must have Lord's orders to do. You damn nitwit. Take him out and give him to the furnace detail. Hey, wait, take care of these prisoners first. Hey, bolt the door, somebody. We don't take no chances with the Aesir. Seg stood about efficiently stripping Shay and Heimdall. Shay wasn't especially afraid. So many extraordinary things had happened to him lately that the whole proceeding possessed an air of unreality. Besides, even the difficulties of such a place might not be beyond the resources of a well-applied brain. Lord, must put in dead mortal cell. No more. All full. All right, get into use. 
The giant gave Shea a cuff that almost knocked him flat and sent him staggering toward the cell which Steg had opened. Shea avoided the mass of corruption at one side and looked for a place to sit down. There was none. The only furnishing of any kind consisted of a bucket whose purpose was obvious. Heimdall followed him in, still wearing his high, imperturbable air. Steg gathered up the corpse, went out, and slammed the door. The giant took hold of the bars and heaved on them. There was no visible lock or bolt, but the door stayed tight. Oh, don't the sleepless one look cute. When we get through with the other race here, we'll come back and show you some fun. Have yourselves a time. With this farewell, the giants all tramped out. Fortunately, the air was warm enough, so Shea didn't mind the loss of his garments from a thermal point of view. Around them, the dungeon was silent, save for a drip of water somewhere and the occasional rustle of a prisoner in his cell. Across from Shea, there was a clank of chains. An emaciated figure with a wildly disordered beard shuffled up to the bars and screamed, He is a louse! and shuffled back again. What means he? From the right came a muffled answer. Not knows. He says it every hour. He is mad, as you will be. Cheerful place. Is it not? Worse, I have seen, but happily without being confined therein. I will say that for a mortal, you are not without spirit, turn up Harold. Your demeanor likes me well. Thanks. I had not entirely forgotten my irritation over Heimdall's patronizing manner, but the sleepless one held my interest more than the choleric and rather slow-witted Thor or the sneering Loki. If you don't mind me asking, Golden One, why can't you just use your powers to get out? To all things there is a limit of size, of power, and of duration. Wide is the lifetime of a god, wider than a thousand of your feeble species, one after the other. Yet even gods grow old and die. Likewise, as to these fire giants and their chief Sirt, that worst of beings, I have not much strength. If my brother Frey were here now, or if we were among the frost giants, I could overcome the magic of that door. How do you mean? It has no lock. It will not open, save when an authorized person pulls it and with intent to open. Look, now. Heimdall pushed against the bars without effect. If you will be quiet for a while, I will try to see my way out of this place. The sleepless one leaned back against the wall, his eyes moving restlessly about. His body quivered with energy in spite of his relaxed position. Not too well can I see. There is so much magic here, fire magic of a kind both evil and difficult, that it hurts my head, yet, this much I see clearly. Around us, all is rock, with no entrance, but by the way, we came. Beyond that, there lies a passage with trolls to watch it. Oh, disgusting creatures. The golden-haired god gave a shudder of repugnance. Can you see beyond? A little. Beyond the trolls, a ledge sits over a pile of molten slag at the entrance of the hall where the flaming swords are forged. And then, and then... His forehead contracted. His lips moved a little. A giant sits by the pool of slag. No more can I see. Heimdall relapsed into gloomy silence. Shea felt considerable respect and some liking for him, 
but it is hard to be friendly with a god, even in a prison cell. Thialfi's cheerful human warmth was missing. Stag re-entered the cell hall. One of the prisoners called out. Good, Stag. A little water, please. I die of thirst. Stag turned his head a trifle. Dinner time soon, slave. The prisoner gave a yell of anger and abuse at the troll, who continued down to his alcove in the most perfect indifference. Here he hoisted himself onto a broken down stool, dropped his chin on his chest, and apparently went to sleep. Nice guy. The prisoner across the way came to the front of his cell and again shrieked. Envy is a louse. The troll is not asleep. I can hear his thoughts, for he is of a race that can hardly think at all without moving the lips, but I cannot make them out. Harold, you see a thing that is uncommon, namely one of the Esir confessing he is beaten. But there is this to be said, if we are held here, it will be the worst of days for gods and men. Why would that be? So near is the balance of strength, gods against giants, that the issue of what will happen at the time hangs by a thread. If we come late to the field, we shall surely lose. The giants will hold the issues against us, our mustering, and I am here, here in this cell with my gift of eyesight that can see them in time to warn. I am here and the Gallahorn, the roaring trumpet that would call gods and heroes to the field is at Sphere's house. Why don't the Asir attack the giants before the giants are ready if they know there's going to be a war anyway? Heimdall stared at him. You know not the law of the nine worlds, Harold. We Asir could not attack the giants altogether before the time. Men and gods live by law, else they would be but giants. He began to pace back and forth with rapid steps, his forehead set in a frown. Shea noted that even at this moment, the sleepless one was careful to place one foot before the other to best display the litheness of his walk. Surely they'll miss you. Can't they set other guards to watch the giants get together or... He finished lamely at the glint in Heimdall's eye. Something? Immortal's thoughts. Ay, ho, ho. Set other guards here and there. Listen, turn up Harold, Harold the fool. Of all of us a seer, Frey is the best, the only one who can stand before Surt with weapons in hand. Yet the worlds are so made, and we cannot change it, that one race Frey fears. Against the frost giants, he has no power. Only I, I and my sword head, can deal with them. And if I am not there to lead my band against the frost giants, we shall live to something less than a ripe old age thereafter. I'm sorry, sir. I no matter. Come, let us play the game of questions. Few and ill are the thoughts that rise from brooding. For hours they plied each other with queries about their respective worlds. In that ominous place, time could be measured only by meals and the periodic shrieks of Envy is a louse. About the eighth of these cries, Steg came out of his somnolent state, went out, and returned with a pile of bowls. These he set in front of the cells. Each bowl had a spoon. One was evidently expected to do one's eating through the bars. As the trolls put the bowls in front of Shay's cell, he remarked loftily. King, see subjects eat. The mess he put in them consisted of some kind of porridge with small lumps of fish in it, 
sour to the taste. Shea did not blame his fellow prisoners when they broke into loud complaints about the quality and quantity of the food. Stegg paid not the slightest attention, relapsing into his chair until they had finished when he gathered up the bowls and carried them out. The next time the door opened, it was not Stegg, but another troll. In the flickering torchlight, this one was, if possible, less handsome than his predecessor. His face was built around a nose of such astonishing proportions that it projected a good 18 inches and he moved with quick cat-like stride. The prisoners who had been fairly noisy while Steg was in charge now fell silent. The new jailer stepped quickly to Shay's cell. You new arrivals, I am strong. You be good, nothing hurts you. You be bad, zip. He made a motion with his finger to indicate the cutting of a throat and turning his back on them, paced down the row of cells, peering suspiciously into each. I had never in my life slept on a stone floor. So I was surprised an indefinite time later to awaken and discover that I had done it for the first time with the result of being stiff. He got up, stretching. Uh, uh, how long have I been asleep? I do not know that. Our fellow prisoner, who disliked someone called Ingvi, ceased his shouting some time since. The long-nosed jailer was still pacing, still muzzy with sleep. She could not remember his name and called out. Hey, you with the nose. How long before breakfast? Why, you call me, you stinking worm, I zip. He ran down to the alcove, face distorted with fury, and returned with a bucket of water, which he sloshed into Shay's surprised face. You son of unwed parents, I roast you with slow fire. I am snog. I am master. You use right name. Heimdall was laughing silently at the back of the cell. That's one way of getting a bath at all events. I guess our friend Snog is sensitive about his nose. That is not unevident. Hey, how many troubles the children of men would save themselves could they but have the skill of the gods for reading the thought that lies behind the lips? Half of all they suffer, I would wager. Speaking of wagers, sleepless one, I see how we can run a race to pass the time. This cage is somewhat less than spacious. What are you doing? It is to be trusted that you do not mean an eating race with those cockroaches. No, I'm going to race them. Here's yours. You can tell him by his broken feeler. The steed is not of the breed. Heimdall Still, took the insect. Still, I will name him Goldtop after my horse. What will you call yours, and how shall we race them? I shall call mine Man of War, after a famous horse in our world. He smoothed down the dust on the floor and drew a circle in it with his finger. Now. Let us release our racers in the center of the circle, and the one whose roach crosses the rim first shall win. A good sport. What shall the wager be? A crown? Seeing that neither of us have any money at all, why don't we shoot for the works and make it 50 crowns? 500 if you wish. Man of War won the first race. Snog, hearing the activity in the cell, hustled over. What you do? Shay explained. Oh, all right, you do. Not too noisy, though. I stop if you do. He stalked away, but was soon back again to watch the sport. 
Gold Top won the second race, Man of War the third and fourth. Shay, glancing up, suppressed, suppressed an impulse to tweak the Susquehannaian nose that the troll had thrust through the bars. By and by, Snog went out and was replaced by Steg, who did not even notice the cockroach racing. As he hoisted himself onto his chair, Shay asked whether he could get some sort of small box or basket. What do you want? Shay explained he wanted it to keep the cockroaches in. Steg raised his eyebrows. I too big for these things. He refused to answer another word. So they had to let the racers go rather than hold them in their hands all day. But Shay saved a little of his breakfast, and later, by the use of it as bait, they captured two more cockroaches. This time, after a few victories for Shay, Heimdall's roach began to win consistently. By the time the man across the passage had yelled, Yngvi is a mouse! Four times, Shay found himself Heimdall's debtor to the extent of something like 30 million crowns. It made him suspicious. He watched the golden god narrowly during the next race, then burst out. Say, that's not fair. You're fixing my cockroach with your glittering eye and slowing him up. What mortal dare you accuse one of the Asir? You're damn right, I dare. If you're going to use your special powers, I won't play. A smile slowly spread across Heimdall's face. Young Harold, you do not lack for boldness. And as I have said before, that you show glimmerings of wit. In truth, I have slowed up your speed. It is not meet that one of the Asir should be beaten at aught by a mortal. But come, let that one go, and we will begin again with new mounts, for I fear that animal of yours will never again be the same. It was not difficult to catch more roaches. Once more shall I call mine Goldtop, after my horse. It is a name of good luck. Did you have no favorite horse? No, but I had a car, a four-wheeled chariot. It was called... I began and then stopped. What was the name of that car? I tried to reproduce the syllables. Nyros, no. Nilos, no, not that either. Neurosis, neurosis, something clicked into place in my brain, a series of somethings like the fragments of a jigsaw puzzle. Heimdall, I believe I know how we can get out of here. That will be the best of news, if the deed be equal to the thought. But I have looked now deeply into this place, and I do not see how it may be done without outside aid. Nor shall we have help from any giant with the time so near. Whose side will the trolls be on? It is thought that the trolls will be neutral. Yet strange it would be if we could beguile one of these surly ones to help us. Nevertheless, something you said a little while back gives me an idea. You remember? Something about the skill of the gods at reading the thought it lies behind the lips. I... I am... I was of a profession whose business it is to learn people's thoughts by questioning them and by studying what they think today predict what they will think tomorrow in other circumstances, even to provoke them to thinking certain things. It could be. It's an unusual art, mortal, and a great skill, but it could be. What then? Well, then, this stake. I don't think we can get far with him. I've seen his type before. He's a, um, 
Well, something I can't remember. But he lives in a world of his own imaginings where he's a king and we're all slaves. I remember now. A paranoic. You can't establish contact with a mind like that. Most justly and truly reasoned, Harold. From what I am able to catch of his thought, this is no more than the truth. But Snog is something else. We can do something with him. Much though I regret to say it, you do not drown me in an ocean of hope. Snog is even more hostile than his unattractive brother. Shea grinned. At last, I was in a position to make use of my specialized knowledge. That's what one would think. But I have studied many like him. The only thing that's wrong with Snog is that he has a, a feeling of inferiority, a complex we call it, about that nose of his. If somebody could convince him he's handsome. Snog handsome? Ho, ho, ho. That is a jest for Loki's tongue. Shh, please, Lord Heimdall. As I say, the thing he wants most is probably good looks. If we could, if we could pretend to work some sort of spell on his nose, tell him it has shrunk, and get the other prisoners to corroborate. A plan of wit. It is now to be seen that you have been associating with Uncle Fox. Yet do not sell your bearskin till you have caught the animal. If you can get snug, sufficiently friendly to propose your plan, then it will be seen whether confinement has really sharpened your wits or only addled them. But, youngling, what is to prevent Snog from feeling his nose and discovering the beguilement for himself? Oh, we don't have to guarantee you to take it all off. He'd be grateful enough for a couple of inches. End of episode five.